Hello, well, welcome to the show. This is Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I wanna have a conversation with you about resiliency. So there's been a shift in recent years from resiliency to delicacy. And it very much relates to the rising addiction, anxiety, depression, and suicide rates. And anytime I talk about these things, there's so much that influences these dynamics, I can't possibly discuss it all. Our relationship with resiliency is a really big deal. Resiliency is necessary to have a good life, and it's not spoken about in mental health enough. There are cultural changes in parenting and in the ways that we live, our very lifestyle, that have been influenced largely from social media, and our mental health individually and collectively are very much affected, and not so much for the better, y'all. I hope this episode shines light in some dark corners to help you see what might be there in your psyche, to consider your subconscious life strategies, to bring them into the conscious forefront. That's where we can work to change whatever you decide to change if you decide to change something. There's so much you can do for yourself, your own life strategy, and if you're raising children, to help them grow resiliency. There's so much to strategize as a highly sensitive person in the world. We are tasked with managing our energy, everybody else's energy. The interactions, the vibes, the verbals, the nonverbals, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the manipulation, the emotional blackmailing, the angry vitriol that can ensue. We're managing all of that all the time on top of our to-do lists in our head and our critical voice and our wise woman or our wise man, our inner child, our inner adolescent. We're so complex. We are managing so much. What I want for you, me, all of us is to live our best lives with clarity. A loaded up, full to the brim coping strategy toolkit. We are experiencing stressors like the human condition has never experienced. The speed of information, the ability to chat and comment, to instantly connect, to instantly, even impulsively, say something to the masses. There are strange consequences we are not going to even know for a very long time. We are also entering the high political season. And I wish this wasn't the truth, but the honest truth is that I didn't see sensitive people handling politics very well last presidential election. And I want to get ahead of and highly recommend understanding resiliency and positive mindset strategies for all of life, but especially for this next American political season that is coming at us fast. We don't wanna give politics the power to disrupt our own nervous systems or our peace of mind. I will be challenging my own individual clients to disallow with a beautiful stubbornness anything about politics. If your advocacy heart has you heated and angry a lot, don't live out that old quote. The Buddha says holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Because anger for the sake of anger, it doesn't do anything but make your own self sick. I am frankly ashamed of public politics across the board and lots of advocacy that uses these heart string pulling topics to justify anger and nastiness. I see politics and advocacy over social media actively teaching people that anger is right, anger is righteous, anger inspires. That's not true. All this kind of anger does is create more distance between us more activation and more nervous systems, more mental health struggle. I wanna to talk to you today about what resiliency is and some strategy shifts that you might consider 
some ways to question your thinking, to embrace simple change, to increase your resiliency, to grow it like muscles, y'all. I talk a lot about emotional strength training. This is what this life is asking us to learn. So what is resiliency? What is it? We all know this word. What actually is it? Here are two definitions I found. Know that it's a noun, which means a person, place, or thing. So resiliency is a thing. It's a thing that we need for life. It is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. Toughness. Another definition of resiliency, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Elasticity. I'm going to offer some questions to sit with or to journal out, to ponder towards strategies that can have you bouncing more than splatting. That's often how I describe resiliency. We don't want the difficult things in life to make us feel like we're splatting that pavement. We want to be able to bounce. That's how we get more flow. That bounce is the resiliency. And just like we want a ball to bounce and not splat, we want ourselves to bounce and not splat. And there are emotional muscles that we can train to better help us with that bounce. Because life is going to throw trials and tribulations. It just is, y'all. Resiliency is not a thing that you learn in five minutes because you listen to one podcast episode. We are tasked, we are asked maybe spiritually, to cultivate these muscles, this resiliency over the course of our lives. Even that is its own resiliency mindset, that the things that happen to us, those very trials and tribulations, they're not happening to us, they're happening for us to help us grow stronger moment to moment. That's an idea that allows us more bounce than splat. And our anger really wants to choose the things that make us splat. See if you notice that as we go through some of this episode. So let's start with giving yourself a score from one to 10. 10 meaning that you are a resiliency badass. You know how to be resilient. You are confident in your bounce. Difficult things happen. You know how to feel your feelings. You know how to Go with the flow and roll. How resilient are you? What would you give yourself today? I think I'd give myself a seven and a half today. And maybe my best is an eight. I know there's always room for improvement, always room for growth. And my life has been an obstacle course of having to bounce for me to get all the way here. I have bounced so many different ways, I might even have to make a list to just look and see, see how far I've come, what I've learned. When you fall off of the horse in life, as the old cliche goes, what do you do? What have you done to this point in your life? Do you take a moment to make sure all your bones are intact, that you don't need the hospital? Do you dust yourself off and get back up on that horse pretty quick? Or do you stay where you are? Do you just lay there, like giving into the ground? Do you beat your fists into the ground? Do you cry and scream about the unfairness? Do you let your mind wrap around the fear of getting back on the horse? What have you done when you have fallen off the horse of life? How long is too long to stay on the ground? I talk all the time that we're supposed to have our feelings, right? How long is a reasonable amount of time to have your feelings after falling off of that horse? And a question like that will have a different answer situation to situation, life season to life season. What do you learn If you give yourself permission to never get back up on that horse at least one more time after a fall. Sometimes we might learn that it's okay to be done and walk away. We might also learn that it's too easy to give up. 
We might let fear make our decisions. How do you decide what is worth avoiding and what is worth doing? When to quit, when to lean in, when to give up, when to try again? What was the messaging from your family on such things? Do you consistently take the easy road or the difficult road? I've seen highly sensitive people kind of split down the middle. Some of us learn early how to practice easy and try for easy. Some accidentally practice difficult and make decisions that bring more difficulty. What influences you making the choices that you make here? What did you see in your parents? What do you want to be similar in your own resiliency? What do you want to be different? Are you happy with the score that you're giving yourself today? Are you giving yourself a a too low score because your critical voice is really cranking out the comments today? Are you too hard on yourself or too easy on yourself typically? What do you think this score predicts about your life? What score would you like? Are you willing to be uncomfortable in the pursuit of growing resiliency muscles? Similarly to someone who's willing to go to the gym And let those muscles ache uncomfortably in the pursuit of physical strength and conditioning. Considering your resiliency is its very own resiliency skill, y'all. To check in, to reevaluate. This is how we learn to bounce better as we go forward in this life. Do you know the difference between complaining and processing? How about ruminating versus releasing? Thinking versus overthinking? Do you know the difference between observation and hypervigilance? What did your family teach you about such things? And what would you like to teach yourself now? No one can give you any hard line parameters here. It's a process to get to know yourself and your own tendencies, what serves you and what doesn't. This is internal emotional boundaries work. Yes, you can still sign up. We start the boundaries course on October 16th. Because if you think you're going to continue to overthink and have peace, I'm sorry, that won't work very well. If you think hypervigilance is the smartest way to live, you will be burnt out on life before it even really begins. Exhaustion makes resiliency harder. We need energy to bounce. There are better ways than just muscling through, beating our heads against the wall, avoiding what's difficult, letting anxiety take over our decision making. If you lean in and do the work, you will grow in your resiliency, believe it or not. Life offers us opportunity to have hard-earned wisdom, so much more than easy-earned wisdom. And that hard-earned wisdom is a higher quality. This is also a big part of practicing resiliency. We don't just throw a plant into a pot and expect it to grow. That plant needs certain conditions. It needs holes in the bottom of that pot. It needs the right size pot. It needs dirt and nutrients for its roots to grip, and it needs water. And too much water won't do, and too little won't do either. Plants teach a lot about resiliency, too. When I moved to the mountains, I moved to well water and moved my big old collection of plants. They got too much salt from our water softener, and they started to suffer. They started to be affected. Different plants in different amounts in different ways. Some could tolerate that salt better than others. When we're taking care of something living, we pay attention to those cues and we adjust. That's a big part of resiliency. Imagine if I had just kept doing the same thing with my plants as they withered, as they dried up, as they became colorless. Just expecting them to just keep on being resilient kind of not fair to expect resiliency when the conditions are jacked up 
and the conditions aren't changing. Here's another idea to consider as it relates to resiliency. What is your own relationship to toughness? The idea, the word, and who taught you about that toughness in that way to bring the feelings you have about that word? It was hard for me as a little girl to be raised with a certain toughness. It's one of the best things I was given from my family. Often I'm talking about what's dysfunctional. I'm a trauma therapist. Even in dysfunctional families, there are things that are quite lovely, quite wonderful, very often. Very few situations have nothing good or nothing golden. I was raised by my grandmother, and I was similar to her. I have her tenacity. I think I have it in my genes. I think I also have it from her nurture. She didn't give me a choice. I think she knew that life would be tough. It had already been tough on me, very little. And she knew that I needed that toughness, especially as the oldest sibling in my family, especially when I was to leave her roof. What was hard for me as a little girl, what made a lot of tears come out of my face, somehow helped me in the formation of this very strong adult backbone I have grown. What's your relationship to toughness? Do you confuse it with harshness? What does it make you feel if I say, life takes a certain toughness? Does it make you mad or sad? Does your inner child pout or want to throw a tantrum? What do you think your feeling shows you about your relationship to toughness? And then toughness relates to resiliency. Here's the definition again. Resiliency is the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape and elasticity. To spring back into shape, we must have a solid form, a solid form that has enough structure, enough toughness to spring back to its shape. Maybe like a memory foam pillow. That's a soft thing that also holds its shape. It has a certain toughness. If it was too soft, it would be like smushing Play-Doh and it wouldn't spring back. We need a certain toughness for life so that we can be resilient, so that we can retain ourselves, retain the shape of who we are, be the shape of who we want to be as we grow into maybe a stronger, more sturdy, more resilient shape. Why might some people think that they shouldn't have to be tough? I've heard that more and more and more in the last handful of years. In mental health, we call all shoulds irrational beliefs. And the sad truth is that irrational beliefs are way too easy and too seductive for our human egos. Our egos love irrational beliefs. They're so righteous. They're so virtuous. They're easy for our idealized inner child to want to believe in and to get all fired up about. It's easy for us to believe in some kind of utopian universe. All these utopian shoulds, these perfectionistic shoulds, these ideals as shoulds. It's easy for us to go there when we don't like reality. Here's some examples of irrational beliefs. I think this is one of the most famous. No child should go hungry. Can't get much virtuous than that. Can't get more right than that. To not believe that no child should go hungry would feel and seem pretty wrong, right? But here's the deal. The real truth is children go hungry every day. Spending time on that should is very masturbatory. It's very pointless. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. And for highly sensitive people that tell me a lot that not having enough energy for this life is one of their top complaints, this is important stuff to understand. Here's another irrational belief. Life should be easier. Things should cost less. But life isn't easier and things cost what they cost. 
and yours, mine, our collective anger, frustration, upset, or righteousness about how it should be doesn't change any of that. Not one little bit. We waste time with shoulding. And it feels like it sounds. We should on our lives. We should on ourselves. And then we wonder why we feel so shitty. We all might have extra hours in the day that we didn't even know we could have if we didn't entertain so many pointless, irrational beliefs. I need you to know that from my perspective, my personal and professional background, I do see that most of our political discord has pathetically devolved into getting people to believe in irrational beliefs, to believe in irrational shoulds. And I wonder if the point of that isn't to just have us so at each other's throats, so screaming shoulds at each other, that we're not even really paying attention to what's really going on around us. We're certainly not paying attention to what we can affect when we're in that mode, because what we can affect are our own lives, our own people in our own lives, our smaller communities, not wasting our energy on globalized rage. Very popular irrational belief right now is I should make more money. And I want to explain why I think that belief is a waste of time and energy and just stokes the fires of victim mentality. Here's a reframe. How do I make more money? Do you feel the difference in that statement? I should make more money. It's very stuck. Where else are you supposed to go with that? What, is it supposed to fall out of the sky at you when you say that? Is your boss supposed to text you immediately with a raise just because you had that thought and that desire? How do I make more money? Do you feel the forward motion? This, qu this way of thinking, how? How do I make more money? It moves us forward. It gives us options. It connects us to possibility. So do you know how to catch, which means noticing to be able to catch and then reframe any irrational belief that comes from your own thinking or comes from outside thinking into you so that you can reframe those things instead of getting caught up in those things to help you reframe towards something actually helpful and useful with your time and energy, your heart, your one precious life, forward motion and positive mindset. Do you know how to do that? And if not, are you willing to learn? Do you know how to lean into what you can do instead of how things should be? I hope you can feel it, how the shoulds really disempower. It's not the intention. It's an accidental side effect. What can I do empowers, it sets us free, as free as we can be to solve a problem in our own lives because there are no magical white knights. Yes, I might believe enough in the woo-woo to believe in the magical fairies and the angels, but I don't think they're gonna show up and just deposit money into my account. I don't think they're just gonna make the grocery store food free the next time I go. What can I do empowers and sets me as free as I can be. Are you willing to learn a reasonable toughness to counterbalance your tenderness, your big feely heart that accidentally goes after those shoulds so that you can put that down, let that go and reframe yourself towards more resiliency? Now, part of what is different in culture now than I think 10 years ago, even 20 years ago, and certainly 30, 40, and 50 years ago, I'm astounded at the amount of parents that I meet who really seem to think that good parenting is all about giving a child a perfectionistic, utopian childhood experience, almost entirely full of ease and entertainment. Part of what I see as a systems theorist that is trained to see how systems relate to one another, how the individual parts are affected within that system and where and when and how changes can be made to positively affect those systems. What's interesting to me is that as parenting has definitely softened through these last decades, depression and anxiety is skyrocketing in youth. 
So I'm wondering if our cultural parenting is strong enough now to help that child learn to hold his or her own shape when life shows up and tries to bend them out of shape, throws them off the horse, tries to splat them on the pavement. This is a frightening trend to consider. That pendulum swings, y'all. Longtime listeners of the show, you've heard me say it, I don't know how many times, our pendulum swing. And the over-harsh, abusive, spanking, leaning into physical assault, anti-listening parenting of older generations seems to have swung to the other side. Overly soft, low to no discipline, over-listening and letting children make decisions that are beyond their maturity and understanding with little to no boundary or difference taught between what's allowed or appropriate for child versus what's allowed and appropriate for adult. Giving children an understanding of themselves not so childlike, but more adult-like. Increasingly in recent years, more parents have shared with me, and when it hasn't been parents, really it's been people concerned for kids that they love that are in their lives that aren't in their charge. In the last year, I have spoken to more people than ever in my almost 20-year career. People who are very, very, very concerned for the children in their lives because they see the children as absolutely out of control. Now, there are certainly parents out there who are doing well in the parenting, doing well for themselves and well for their children. I'm not talking to them or about them. I'm talking about the struggles. I am shocked that I have heard so many parents and so many people talk about raising kids without ever saying no to a child. I've heard about five stories in the past six months of nannies quitting because the expectation in the household is that the children are never told no, not about anything, never, ever, whatever they want they get which creates an impossibly overstimulating and chaotic environment that creates bratty, entitled, unboundaried behavior and expectations in children instead of contained, grounded practice for real life, real world dynamics. Because the real world will not give any child bowling bumpers the way a family Parenting this way can try to do as long as it can, I guess, until life just sort of finds a way to bring in the difficulty. Imagine the impact of never hearing no or rarely hearing no until you're out of the nest. How scary, how frightening, how discombobulating, disorienting, confusing. No wonder we're seeing college age, 22, 23, 24, 25 year olds screaming at college professors when they don't like what's being said while they're being filmed, while they know they're being filmed. What does this teach a human being to not get enough no when they're young? Is this parenting style for the child, for the child's true greater good or the parents' comfort in the moment? How can we better prepare our children for the myriad of ways that life tells us, no, nope, not you, you lost, you're not gonna win this time, and you don't get what you want? If this is your parenting style, how does it work? How do you feel? How do your kids feel? Does it prepare your child for life without you? Is that really what might be happening here? A severe codependency that creates children that really don't know how to fly the nest? A very hard truth about some codependency that can feel like a real sting the first time we hear it is that codependency is very, very selfish. It's about making sure that you're not witnessing somebody else be uncomfortable, which backfires and makes so many people uncomfortable. It'd be one thing if it worked. 
Our subconscious is a powerful, powerful thing, y'all. If we need to be needed as a parent, how might that affect parenting? I wonder why you've chosen this style, if this is your style. Now, I have an addiction specialty. I started my career working in residential and intensive outpatient treatment. And I'm not going to go off on a big addiction tangent here, maybe in another episode or even in a live stream. But with rising addiction rates, I can very much see how permissive parenting is one of the greatest contributors. I can also see how the other side of the pendulum, the very strict authoritarian parenting is too. Basically, to not be told no during development results in difficulty knowing how to tell the self no. Add drugs to not knowing how to tell yourself no. And bam, that's an easy way to get a problem with any substance or any addictive behavior like sex, porn, gambling, spending, accumulating stuff. We might not be doing so great as a society to teach real life priorities, critical thinking, decision making. And those are very important elements to creating resilient human beings who have to make very, very tough decisions to take care of themselves in this life, this life that could throw any and all of us wrenches into the plan, things we never could have imagined happening to us will happen to us in this lifetime. Look at your own life to see how true that is. So what are your priorities? You can't be resilient if you don't know your priorities. Many of you out there, you're into self-development for sure. You're probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's basically a pyramid. You might have seen the picture as you have learned more about psychology over the years, which basically says that the big wide fat part of the triangle on the bottom, it gets skinny at the top, smaller into a point, is that we need our physiological and physical needs met first. You know, the basics, food, water, shelter. And then we need our psychological needs. That's our socializing, our communities, our psychological wellness practices, like the morning routine that we've put out on the show, meditating, turning on music, keeping yourself clean, brushing your teeth, hygiene. Yes, that's physical, but there's a major psychological component. Self-care is self-love and action. And as we go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then we start to hit things like self-actualization after all those other needs are met. Self-actualization is basically us living out our purpose. Now, I cannot tell you how many people I've spoken with who very much want to focus on self-actualization from their parents' basement or without having a career figured out or even a home base. Many want to prioritize their wellness and then get to living, then be resilient. When the truth is that we need to live now, every day, and stop putting off our own lives by chasing higher order ideals when we haven't yet mastered the basics. When I hear youth talk about their priorities, I am more often than not confused because it just sounds to me like a lot of fancy words strung together that try to make it sound reasonable and right to learn to run before walking or crawling. How is that really supposed to work for an individual or for our society? We have to juggle our lives and our healing, not put either our healing on hold to try to live or our lives on hold to try to heal. We embrace these ideas as our resiliency that we understand every moment. I don't care what semantics we're giving ourselves to jump through and around. Every moment, whether we realize it or not, we are living and healing. What I see work the best in my own life and in the lives of my clients and people that I love 
and admire is getting back on the horse in life as quickly as possible. No excuses. That's how we grow resiliency. If your victim mentality gets mad at me during this episode, now or ever, that's probably a good sign. Victim mentality has to hate resiliency. Victim mentality has to hate self-sufficiency. Victim mentality hates that you have a choice in your life moment to moment. Victim mentality has to dislike you learning how to let go of what no longer serves you. Victim mentality wants you very much to hold on to what doesn't serve you because that will grow the victim mentality, which is the opposite of resilient. So when I make your victim parts mad, good. Those of you who want your victim parts encouraged will need to go elsewhere because it's not me. I will not entertain it. No matter what has happened to you, no matter how dire your circumstance may be or how it may seem or how it may feel or look, you are a human and we were meant to survive what needs surviving. And we were meant to thrive when, where, and how we can in this one precious life. You come from a long line of strong human beings, all of them, every single one who figured out how to survive enough for you to get all the way to here. Tap into that strength. Believe in it. I'm a believer that faith that word, that idea has been so commandeered by religion. I think there's such a wider purpose for our understanding of faith. You don't necessarily have to have faith in some kind of God or energy or the universe. Have faith in your own human line of everything that had to happen for you to get all the way to here to this moment. This is part of how we feel alive. And that's what we really want when we're talking about resiliency. These are the skills that help us feel more alive no matter what, despite whatever hard crap falls in our lap. Whatever big, big, giant mistakes we make. Embrace resiliency and you embrace life and not just any old stinking life. You embrace your one precious life. So, will you join me Will you allow yourself to be more resilient now? To lean in 